Welcome to Transparency with Diana B, a podcast from wealthmanagement.com focused on advisors' personal well being and healing. In this podcast, we explore some of the deepest struggles and hardships that many advisors face and bring these issues out into the open so that others may find healing. Join us for this journey where we explore ways to overcome the stresses and anxieties as Diana draws from years of expertise and guest experts to manage the personal challenges of advisors. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Transparency with Diana B, a podcast by WealthManagement.com. My name is Diana Britton, and I'm the managing editor of WealthManagement.com. For those of you who are new to the podcast, each episode focuses on a personal development issue facing financial advisors. Guests join me to talk about their own experiences, dealing with a struggle. And really, these are things that impact everyone, not just advisors. My guest today is Steve Mellon, an advisor with Legacy Wealth Management Group in Tiburon, California, who actually flew out to New York to be here in person. That's right. Steve, welcome to the podcast, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Yes, I, how did I get so lucky to actually be here, to be chosen <laughs> for this, uh, this interview? Um, I mean, Steve, you've got an incredible story. Um, I know you got into the industry in your 20s. You worked at Schwab for a while, then you moved over to Morgan Stanley. Now you're at LPL. Um, but I'd love to hear what was going on in your personal life during that time. And you know, in, in your first year at Morgan Stanley, you were diagnosed with stomach cancer. Yeah, yeah. Well, so this is, uh, I ha I've had a couple big, big challenges in my life, and uh, life was going pretty smoothly until that point. You know, I'd spent about 14 years at Charles Schwab, and then I made this transition to one of the big five, and uh, I thought things were, there, the, no limit to where I could go from this. And uh, nine months after I had made the move, I was diagnosed with stage three stomach cancer. And it was a complete shock to my life. And at this point, uh, I had had an, a new baby in the house. So my daughter was, um, was one year old. And I had uh, a remodel in my house that was going haywire. And I had, and I had these, uh, the new job that I had. First job, time I had switched jobs in my life, really, because I had started at uh, Schwab out of college. And uh, so everything was going perfectly until that moment. There was that oh shit moment that just came that one day where they said, well, you've got stomach cancer. And, uh, you know, everything changed in an instant. And, uh, you know, I should have known, maybe paid attention to some of the signs earlier on. I, uh, I initially had some pain in my uh, soft, lower esophagus, upper stomach area that uh, I went to the doctor for, and they said, it's stress. You've got a new baby. You've got a new job. You've got, you know, uh, you're fairly newly married, and that's just life. And you're th only 37 years old. So uh, I, 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 they gave me some stuff called protonics that was just sort of antacid stuff. And then three or four months later, I'm still having the pain, and I go back again. And they think, well, maybe you have an ulcer. you still got the new job. you still got all these things going on that are normal for someone that's your age. Uh, there's a lot of stress involved in your life. Well, the third time I ended up waking up, well, I was actually in my office at, uh, at Morgan Stanley and they brought in Korean barbecue. I just remember this one day in January, 2008. And uh, I ate the Korean barbecue and I felt so sick that I actually threw up in my garbage can. And mm -hmm. that was, I've never done that. I've never thrown up in my office or I'm just not, it's just not, uh, in my nature. So I knew something was different at that point. Something was up. Right. So I went home and I tried to just ease the pain. I had this kind of sharp pain right in my uh, upper upper uh, abdomen area. So my, my wife at the time was out of town for business and, um, and I tried to go to sleep that night and I couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. I was up all night. So the first thing in the morning, um, I have a little baby there and I have a nanny coming over and I had to go to work, but I said, I can't, I'm going to go to the emergency room. It's too early to, uh, to go to the, uh, to go to my doctor. So basically hop in the car, drive to the emergency room and they do blood work and they say, you're anemic. And I said, well, you know, I, I don't know why I'd be anemic. Uh, they said, have you had any recent surgeries or internal bleeding? And so now it's starting to get kind of serious. Right. So then they go, well, we want to do a scan. They do a scan, they see something. Then they go, well, there's something there. And then we want to do an endoscopy. Then they do the endoscopy. They find a mass. They say, you've got cancer. And they said, your pancreas is also swollen. It might be pancreatic cancer. So this is all within a few hours mm. going from everything was wonderful 
working hard but stressful to I've got entire s- life entire change. life changing in an instant. Yeah. So, you know what what do I what do I do with this now? I I, I have a couple friends that come visit me and I'm lighthearted saying, oh, I think I have pancreatic cancer, you know, and I didn't know how bad that was. I mean, that's like a... Pancreatic is the, it's the most worst. aggressive form of cancer, right? Exactly. That, I think the five-year survival is about 5%. And I know this only after the fact that I did a little research, but I didn't know anything at this time. I didn't have websites or support groups or anyone who had had stomach or pancreatic cancer. Uh, I found out later that when I was in the hospital, Patrick Swayze was down the hall from me. He was in there <laughs> with his pancreatic cancer with my same doctors. Oh. And I was getting my stomach, you know, surgery and he was going through his treatments and, you know, a year later he's dead and I'm, you know, I'm still here 12 years later. So, um, you know, looking back, it was a lot of interesting stuff that was happening at that time that I wasn't really aware of. Yeah. But that was the diagnosis day, uh, was in, I think it was January 18th of 2008 and they wanted to have, so I got three separate opinions within that two weeks going from hospital to hospital, to friend, to, to meeting with with different people. And I ended up, uh, choosing Stanford because they wanted to be very aggressive and I'd always wanted to get into Stanford, Mm. but so now I'm like, the joke was I'm going to get into Stanford now. It's really the hospital, you know? So Uh, my dad and uncle both got their master's and PhD at Stanford and I couldn't get in because my grades were, you know, he said, if you had a 4.0 instead of a 3.0, we could help you, but not. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I got into Stanford and they wanted to have the surgery on January 30th. And I said, no, that's my birthday. I don't want my death day and birthday to be the same day because there was a high probability I died on the operating table. Mm, gosh. So I pushed it a week after. And so that's where, you know, it was February 6th, and that's where I ended up having my stomach, my spleen, half my pancreas, and a third of my esophagus removed. Oh, wow. And then I, it went downhill from there because I, they had to code blue me, and it was I, I spent a week on sedation and on a breathing tube, and, you know, I would, I would wake up in the hospital and hallucinating and it was a it was a it was a tough month in the hospital but you came when you came out of surgery um you had to go what happened you had to go back in right for some right. reason yeah so i came out of the surgery and i was thumbs up everything was great i was in the icu i had my friends from college and high school that were all there and and uh i just remember sitting <clears throat> in the icu with one of my friends and he was and we had i had a nose tube and a stomach tube and a neck tube and i was just looking like hell but we saw something shoot out of my nose tube into the to this this bucket thing and and he just kind of turned pale and looked away and he goes that didn't and i'm like i don't know what that was and so over the next 15 20 minutes i started to kind of get woozy and my nurse who was this young three month new nurse who had just started working there came in and saw me and said, something's really wrong with him. Mm. And she, and the, the doctor on call said, everything's fine. This is normal. And she goes, no, it's not normal. So she called the code blue and I didn't even know what, what that was. That basically that everyone gets out, all the doctors come in. Next thing you know, I'm getting wheeled back into surgery. Mm. And I remember the last thing I remember basically was getting, tr- they were trying to get me into an elevator and I, the bed didn't fit. They had to knock off the legs of it because they had an extension on it and i remember the movie 12 monkeys that brad pitt was in and bruce willis that he was going crazy and i felt like i was in this movie where they were going to basically take me away and i was never going to come back and i was just out of my mind kind of temporarily and then i woke up uh five six days later uh strapped to the bed yeah so because i tried to tear everything out of my neck and nose and it was it was, uh, I guess you come out of sedation uh, in a very uh, animalistic way and you're fighting things. And, and I thought my body or my organs were being harvested and taken to China. Like I just thought I was hallucinating. And basically. you're on a lot of A lot medications. of medications right That Yeah. So that, that was the beginning. So, but from there, it was basically a slow, you know, next three weeks, every little day they would take away a tube or a... Mm-hmm a catheter or, you know, whatever it was, it was just, uh, it was a slight progress every day for the next month. And so when you finally got out of the hospital, the real problem started after that, right? You had to go through chemo and radiation. Yeah. uh, I mean, what they want you to do is get strong enough to do chemo and radiation. And I I knew that I was going to have to do that. I just didn't know, you know, the extent of how bad that was. About 
two months after uh, I started a chemo regimen where you'd go into Stanford and you would end up uh, get hooked up to an IV for several hours, and then you'd go home with these horse pills uh, for the next five days, and and you did that for I, I, it's been twelve years now, so I don't remember exactly the the amount sure. how many weeks yeah. it was, but in the middle of that also they overlapped uh, radiation, which radiation, you know, chemo and radiation at the same time, I was uh, I was starting to lose a lot of weight, mm. so I initially before the surgery went in, I was about one hundred and seventy pounds and six foot one, and uh, through the next a year, I got down to 95 pounds. Wow. And so I was, I was having a tough time getting the, keeping hydration and keeping you know, calories in me. Mm. So and at this point also, uh, the doctors are giving me whatever I want to ease my, my pain and my nausea. So I was taking all sorts of drugs that was, that I was just doing whatever they said. I, they, they had a Stanford pain med specialist team that would come in and advise me. And I had never taken you know, pills before. So they're like, all right, you're going to start out with an oxycodone in the morning, breakthrough, and then oxycontin. And then you'll take Ativan for this anxiety. And you'll take this, all, all these different things. I left the hospital basically an addict because I was a mm-hmm. month of, I had a button that I could push. And whenever I wasn't feeling good and I was in constant discomfort and pain. So it's crazy to think, I mean, I, I how, how much they gave me at that time, because I think his, I think historically people don't survive all of this. I mean, I guess I almost died on the operating table a second time. Um, I, uh, they they had to really work hard to keep me alive after that emergency surgery. And uh, my friend who was the anesthesiologist said that he had, almost had to go out twice and tell my wife that I wasn't going to make it. Oh, gosh. So I, I didn't know. I was just going through it. I didn't know that you know, what they were all going through, my friends, my wife. I mean, my daughter was too young. She, was only, she didn't, wasn't really allowed to see me because she was just too young at that point. But, I mean, everyone else was going through a lot while I was just being worked on and sedated, basically, for yeah. a while. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but what was, you know, chemo and radiation like? I know that you, um, you know, towards the end of radiation, you were really struggling physically um, and emotionally, I'm sure, um, what were you going through at that time? Well, the chemo was was bad. Uh, it was just I was just nauseous all the time. It's like take the the flu and multiply times ten, and and you just you, you think you can it, everything's going to be easy where you can oh I'll just read books and I'll do it. You can't even read books. You're just so beaten up that you, like watching TV it can be hard, and you can't get out of bed, and you're nauseous and you're dry heaving all the time, and and you can't, that means if you're dry heaving, you can't really get food in. So you, I started losing a lot of weight. So then they couple the radiation with radiation. Um, is It's this mystery thing. You can't see it, but, you know, it's cumulative and it builds up over, over, over time. So now I'm doing radiation and I'm getting, I, I go into the, the oncologist and, and the radiation therapy and I'm basically lying in this bed that they made a mold for me and, you know, they've got my shirt up and they've got, they tattoo three little tattoos on me to where they're going to aim this radiation on my abdomen. And, and then they say, hold your breath and they, and these things come out and you get radiated. You don't really see anything, but you're basically getting zapped. Right. And it's funny. We all, I mean, in the waiting room, coming to the back door, there was a guy in an orange jumpsuit that was with shackles and chains getting radiation too. He came from San Quentin, which is right near me. So we're all getting the same kind of radiation treatment. But, uh, but during this time now, I'm, I'm losing so much weight that they, that they had to do something to help me stop losing. And so they had to put, uh, give me on TPN, which is, I don't even know what it stands for, but it, they had to put a pick line, which is a line, which I have the scar, right? I mean, you can see a little dot right there. Yeah, my It's, it's in it. my, in my arm that goes up into my, into my body that feeds me nutrients. So I had this uh, line in me that I would wear a backpack and they would pump me in nutrients every, you know, every day. I'd have a pump basically that would just put this white fluid into me that would give me nutrients. Mm. So I wouldn't lose anymore because I couldn't get enough calories in to stop that loss. So that saved me really. Um, but I got to one day, uh, you know, I don't know how many times people have had this. I, I can't take this anymore. I don't know how much more I can take moment in your life. Mm. Like it, like I've had, I think four of those where I said, I don't know how much more I can take. That was one of them mm. where it just gives me chills thinking about it. Cause, Oh God, I was just like, I just want to die. I don't want to kill myself. But like, if I just died, I'd be 
better off than I am right now. So I go on your last day of radiation. Yes. You walked in. I I just said to the doctor, I said, I don't know how much more I can take, but I'll do whatever you say. And I was crying tears down Mm -hmm. my face. And he said, Dr. P said, (laughs) we are, uh, this is your last day then. And you've done, and I said, really? And he said, yeah, you've done 90% of what the plan was, but you've done way more than I thought you could make it. And so it was just a sigh of relief. I was like, okay, well, I mean, one, am I letting him down? But I'm not sure if I was like, I want want to do 100%. I didn't want to do 90, but I didn't think I could take much more. Yeah. Because in this process, in in the prior week, I actually had to go to the ER and spent a couple days in the emergency room because I got blocked blockage in me and so it was so crazy it was literally next door Mm. the radiation and i had they had to pick me up in an ambulance and pick me up in ambulance from the er or my room take me downstairs put me in the ambulance drive me next door take me into the radiation zap me take me back in the ambulance and you know i was like i'll walk i can do it Mm. and they would actually you know say you we light we're not you know the liability won't allow us to do that you need to take the ambulance next door so when I finished that, I got a nice little, you know, certificate. You've completed radiation, signed by everyone. And, then, you know, and it, it's, these are depressing places. You go into the chemo and radiation rooms and you look around and people are not looking very good. You know, I know my, my father passed away a couple of years ago from pancreatic can- cancer. Oh. Um, you know, in under six months, he passed away. But we, when he was diagnosed, I was in the room with him and we tried to get him to do chemo. Um, you know, so at least he would live for a few more months, but I mean, we had arguments with him about that. I mean, my mom just tried to convince him and he just didn't have the fight in him. I, he did go one or two times, but he just said, I want to, you know, I know what's coming yeah, and I want to be at home with my, my grandkids and my wife, you know, during my last days. I don't want to be in that chemo room, Oh, I understand. even if it gives me a couple more months you know, and what he did, he was very medicated. He just slept a lot. You know, he said sleeping was like ice cream oh, yeah. for him. <laughs> oh. um, you know, after you sort of went through all that, I know you had the addiction to the painkillers still. Yes. You know, and when they have when you have cancer, they don't say no to you. No uh, you one know, said they no give to me. You Friends, family, and oh. all that stuff. Um, but what was what happened after that? You you um, <clears throat> you had to detox right from that yeah yeah i mean i little did i know well i i knew that i had a problem because the pain pill use was accelerating and at one point uh, i remember i had a fentanyl patch that i had i was taking dilaudid pills i had oxycontin and oxycodone and i had um ativan for anxiety like they was all given to me Oxy, I was able to, oh, in uh, liquid Vicodin too, it's called Loratab, I think. So I was taking all these things and I finally thought I was making real progress because I'm going, I got rid of the fentanyl patch and, and the Ativan and the Loratab and the Dilaudid and I was just taking Oxy. And I was, in my mind, I'm making progress. I'm going, mm-hmm. that's it. But those pills started to add up. You know, they were giving me higher doses. It was these 20 milligram pills they were giving me and I was taking five a day, which <clears throat> is is a lot now that I think about it, but the five a day went up to 10 a day, that Mm. went up to 20 a day. Wow. Right. So by the end of my whole run, which was about a, uh, from surgery to the detox from that was about 16 months. Mm. And, uh, and so that, you know, so about four months prior to my final cutoff, I had worked with my doctor to try to get a plan because I said, I'm, I'm going in the wrong direction, doc. I need, I need to get off this stuff. And and I was advised by my friend who was the Stanford doctor and the NC that he said, This is gonna be a real problem. You're gonna to have to you're gonna to have to deal with this at some point. And I said, I'm like, I'll deal with it. I can handle this. I'm I'm not an addict. I can stop. Well, yeah, tr- <laughs> this stuff is from the devil. This it's like heroin, I guess. I've never done heroin, but uh, I understand it's like synthetic heroin. So um so, and so I, you weren't taking it for the pain anymore. Uh, there there I, came a point where you that's the misconception is that I literally had this what's called chronic pain now. It wasn't okay. the acute pain. So at first, you know, if you break a finger, your finger hurts, you take something forward, the pain goes away, but then the, the bone heals. Well, I had this pain from the surgery because they had to crack my ribs to oh, get God. in 
to take the organs out. So, and I had a huge slice that wrapped around from the front of me to the back. And so there was actual pain there that lasted for quite a while. But then after a while that heals. So, I mean, what t time does it take? Does it take, you know, three months, six months or whatever? So now I've got this pain that whenever I lowered my doses of the Oxycontin, the pain would elevate and I'd start to feel sick and, and I was convinced that it was real pain. So, but I knew that I had to get off of them because those things were just terrible and I was taking more and more. Mm. So I'm now on a plan to cut down 10% a month and uh, January of the following year. And instead I was going up and I'm going, this is not going, going well. So my final month, I took my monthly allotment in two weeks Wow. And I was trying, I was breaking them in half even, taking, I was, my 20, there was 20 pills I took a day. I was taking them in 40 pills. So it was 400 milligrams that I was taking a day, which is, I mean, that would kill me right now in an instant. But I was taking that and trying to break, trying, trying really hard. And at this point, <clears throat> my wife was saying, you know, you've got a problem. You know, you, mm. you've got to stop this. And I'm going, I know, I'm, I'm trying. And it was just not that easy. So, so I... I decide I was had like one or two pills left, and I said, "All right, I'm just gonna I'm gonna stop." Well, easier said than done because 48 hours later, I'm I can't even get out of my off my floor. I have to get wheeled into the emergency room because I, I my pulse is down. I thought I literally thought I was dying. That I'm not even gonna make it to the ER. She we we get wheeled in there and they do every test and the, it's not the cancer it's not the pain and they they say do you want to you know do you want a shot of Dilaudid and I said yes <laughs> give it to me and my wife looks at me and she's like no don't give it to him and she starts crying and she leaves the room and I said just give it to me give me the shot I within ten minutes I'm up out mm. walking out of there feeling great mm. and then I knew for a fact that it was the it was the meds it was an not addiction. it was an yeah. addiction so now i'm like okay if i felt that better that quick then it's all of that and i need to get over this and so i knew there's a two part in withdrawal there's the physical and there's the mental and the mental is harder than the physical because you gotta it's all between your ears and you think you're going crazy and everything but but yeah i i de it took me so i went cold turkey that time and which i should have probably gone to some sort of facility but I went cold turkey and um, spent a week on my floor. Mm. I couldn't even get off my floor. I, I, that was another moment where I said, I don't, that was probably worse than the moment before. Like I, right. I, if, if I could just die right then, I would have definitely been happier. Mm. So I, a week on my floor, a week on my, in my bed, and then a week in my couch, and then finally worked my way to get back into the office with a note from my doctor, and he said, you need to go part-time into the office, not full. And I said, I'll be fine. Well, he was right. I probably went back a little early, and it was hard, but I just had to get back. And ironically, the day I get back, they wanted to do photos for, my, for the website and for everything in my company. And I said, I do not want a photo of me. <laughs> I'm, you know, 100 pounds. I am just looking, looking terrible. So I didn't do my photos that day. But I, that was the beginning of the progress. Now, over the next month, I ended up gaining 25 pounds. So it was miraculous. Like all of a sudden I got some calm and and my little sanity back and I started gaining weight and getting strength and I could now walk a little bit and things got significantly better. So that's when I started to go back to what I thought was normal life to me. Yeah. Which included like drinking alcohol, which I hadn't done in a year and a half. Right. And, and that sort of led to another addiction right yeah, yeah well the alcohol is just another form of what it was and at this point you know i'm fighting i'm fighting off my wife's not so happy with me anymore we're not getting along as well because of the pill addiction and you know i'm trying to just work and raise my daughter and and i'm starting to lose connection with my daughter my wife and life and so i just went back to having glasses of wine and the wine just got worse and worse over the next couple of years. And it, be, it, was, it ended up being, I look back, a substitute for, like everything changed, I think, chemically in my head from that month in the hospital. And so now I have the fear of dying in my head because I'm not through the cancer thing yet. Right. I'm you probably still have that. <laughs> yes, I, to, not as much, but yes, it's still right. there. Um, insecurity 
for how I look because I've lost a lot of weight and all of a sudden I'm a new person. I'm, I don't look the same. Um, and my relationship with my wife is starting to distance. And, you know, my, I, I was starting to just kind of be sad and depressed. Not, I didn't have a full depression, but it was, it was like, this is, I was medicating it. I medicated, medicated, and I just medicated more. And uh, it was a terrible path to take. It was, it was not good for me. Yeah, and so um, tell me about the recovery and how you kind of got through some of this stuff. I mean, I know that you said to me, you know, I thought this was really profound. You said getting into these dark places is really easy. Getting out of them is what's hard. <laughs> yeah. um, and you really went through some dark days, you know, as we've heard here. What kept you going through all that? I mean, kept you, how did you get through it? And, uh, you know, was it the fear of losing your daughter? Yes. And yeah, uh, you know, the, at that point in my life, my, my daughter was basically my, uh, was my angel. You know, that was my, that was, and I didn't want to lose her. You know, I, you know, I come from this, you know, I have abandonment issues because I was a, adopted at two years old. And, you know, so I, right. and my mom tells my dad I died in a car accident. And so I never knew my biological parents until now. I know now, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I just had these issues that I, and I just wanted to be liked and I wanted to be loved and, and uh, so from, from that point, I'm now losing my daughter. That was like the one real true love because my wife, I didn't feel was as in love with me anymore because I was losing that. And I put her through so much hell through the cancer thing that I, I didn't, I don't look back and blame her for that because, you know, she put this wall up and it was very painful because she didn't want to, I mean, the fear of losing me was was terrible. Mm. And so I have some understanding for her now that I'm in my clarity that I am for the past six, seven years. But uh, at, at the time, I was just like, you don't know what I'm going through. You know, it's I'm the one who's dying. I'm the one who's in pain here. And now I see how, you know, those, those caregivers and the people that are supportive of you are maybe even suffering more mentally than, than you are. I was just medicating. So mm. my behavior not in public as much, but uh, privately at home, I was just I, I was just isolating and drinking when I got home at, at night, and I was just being less productive and and not going to the office as much, but still connecting with all my clients. So I was I was with my clients. And they were I mean, even when I was in the hospital in ICU, I still had my computer and was talking with my clients. Wow. So I I mean, I, I had a client call me when I was in the ICU, and and he said. Steve, uh, so and so from blankety blank company, I won't mention, said that you're in a coma and you're, you're, you're about, you may die. I'm just, you know, I'm just calling to see if you're okay. And I said, and I'm like, Joe, yes, I'm here. I've got your counts right in front of me. I'm, I'm st actually looking at it right now. I'm in the hospital, but I'm, I'm here to help you out. And I'm, I'm fine. I just, I didn't want to tell you before because it was only supposed to be a couple days and I thought I would get out, but it, it ended up being worse than I thought. So I just thought that was pretty ruthless in this business for someone to, you know, call yeah, this never person. Heard of yeah. Anyone doing something that I'll ruthless. Never, I'll yeah, never forget that. I'll never forget Trying to get this. your client while you're, it, we have cancer in the hospital. Oh, like, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, we're just looking out for you and making sure your accounts are okay. Steve's in a coma right now. And uh, <laughs> really? So from that point on, all communication from my wife to the, to my friends and, and, and co colleagues ceased because... It was just like, oh gosh, I got to protect myself even in this vulnerable state. So now that I'm kind of recovering from the cancer and I'm putting, now I'm kind of killing myself instead of the cancer killing me. And it's being self-induced, which my wife is like, you're killing yourself now. So I got to a point, I was just, uh, I decided to go to rehab and I was embarrassed about it. And I snuck away and didn't tell my, you know, my work or anyone. And I just said, I'm going to go, go in there. And I, I was embarrassed because I had a problem and I didn't want to admit it to anyone. And so I, I didn't even do insurance or anything. I was just like, nope, I'm going to go in. I'll pay cash. That I... So I made it two weeks in there. And by this time I'm feeling great. It's all out of my system. And I, I'm with a lot of crazy people that, have, that are going through a lot of a lot of other things, but I, I had this wife and kid and house and all, I had all those things and I had to get back and I had to get back and provide for them. And I was now feeling okay after two weeks of 
sobriety, you know, you kind of get back into it. And I, now I thought I could handle it. Mm. Well, um, I couldn't handle it. You just, you think you can, you think you're now smart, like I'll just have a glass of wine. Well, that one glass of wine turns into two, turns into four, turns into two bottles and turns into four months later, I'm waking up at three in the morning with like, it's physical and mental, like I'm shaking and I'm sweating and my pulse is down and I I gotta have a glass of wine at three in the morning. Like I'm just out of my mind, like this is depressing. So on that last day, which was May 2nd, six years ago, I, uh, I was on the floor of my kitchen and I just remember for the first time ever praying out loud like looking up and asking for help and said, you know, cause I knew I couldn't do it anymore. I, I can't continue this, but I didn't know how I was going to stop. I was, it was just lost control. So I prayed out loud and I said, please help me, whatever. And so that day I reached out to a couple people who I know had been successful at, and in going to some rehabs and to text them in the morning. And they found a place, another place for me, a different one. And I checked and I, asked my wife to, uh, to, you know, can you please drive me to rehab? And she says, fuck no, you're going on your own. I'm not you. like, but this time we were done. Like we were already like going, we we're separating, right? but not officially paperwork. We were just separating. So she's like, you're going on your own. I'm like, please just do this for me. This is the last thing I'll ask of you. So she's like, fine. So we hop in the car, drive an hour, drops me off. And that was the last day that we were sort of together. And I spent a month in in rehab and then they wanted me to do aftercare stuff so i instead of going home which my wife wanted nothing to do with me and uh, she had i mean i was getting paperwork faxed to me while i was in rehab about you know divorce i'm like god beat me while i'm down you know so i'm divorcing and feeling insecure and lonely and and so i'm like screw it i'm gonna go to sober living and i live there for the next five months so that's that was my transitional phase but it was you know talk about creating a new new self like right it, i had to rewire everything the last 27 years of lively partying and fun and cre- the, my persona that i created i had to remake it all over again that was hard mm. and so i know that uh can you talk a little bit about how you found healing and and moved on with your life and got past the addiction. I know that you you told me you were at you were like for example you were at this party. Oh gosh. Um, you, can you take me back to that party? Because <laughs> um, I think this re- will really help people. You know the mindset that you finally ca- got to will help other people in this situation. Right. Get past this, these things. Well, okay. So you're sober. You're um, I'm, I'm in a small community. Uh, I'm trying to not, I'm not out there as much as I used to be because I was embarrassed about everything that was going on. I was a kind of a failure. And so, uh, fortunately about three years prior, I had reconnected through Facebook of all places, uh, with a high school girl who was my first in high school. And, and she came to a horse race with my first horse that I own, because I own some horses. And I reconnected with her, and I hadn't seen her in 25 years. So when I got out of rehab, I was looking for just to feel like someone liked me, mm-hmm. positive. Right. Uh, you know, I was in this house that I wasn't feeling loved. I didn't feel like a father because my daughter was being taken away from me. I couldn't see her without supervised visits, so that was painful. Uh, I wasn't feeling like a husband, uh, you know, I just, or a man, I just wasn't, I didn't have any of those things. I was like as low as I could be, but I still, you know, was alive and survived cancer. And I, I knew that it would get, I didn't know, I was hoping it would get better. And so I reconnected with my now wife during that time. And we, and she supported me, uh, in ways that I wasn't getting in the past and just made me want to be more productive and good. And, but it was a, at a distance, you know, I, she was lived in, in Southern California, I lived in Northern California, but at least I, I had this positive experience and I could communicate with someone which I had lost, uh, for the last few years. So I'm now living alone for the first time in my life 
it's strange to think I was 43 years old, but I had went from my parents' house to college roommates, to roommates after college, to girlfriend, to wife, to rehab roommates, to mm-hmm. all that. Like it, I'd always had someone that was roommates. And then now I'm, I've got a, uh, I'm alone in an apartment and I've had supervised visits with my daughter that I could only see a couple days a week that I had to sign this contract for with my, my ex, which was just painful. So now I'm, I'm trying to get out. And the first sort of coming out party was there was a Christmas party that year, hoity toity party, big multi million dollar house, and they have it every year. And it was, and I had gone to it, but I'd been drinking the prior years. This is my first year sober and alone, not with my, my ex wife. So I'm like, I'm going to show up and I'm going to go. And at this point, my ex had said, Well, I'm going to go there with my boyfriend. So I'm going, Oh, shit. All right, so I'm alone. She's with a boyfriend, and I knew who this guy was. You know, I mean, I, I had, didn't know him well, but you know, he, Ferrari driving, like you know, he he had his thing going on, and and he's she's dating him, and so now I'm, I'm happy for her because I didn't. It wasn't that I wanted to be back with her, but I wanted to be confident and come and yeah, be in society, sure. you know, without being a loser, which I felt like a loser. Let's just put it that way, except for the fact with my. Uh, my relationship, my new relationship was starting. That was the only part that I really felt good in, good in my life. So I go to the party, valet parking, and I stand outside, and I'm just waiting to go in. I'm like, all right, let's, let's do this. So I walk in alone, and I go in, and I'm sitting there and looking around, and you know, everyone's there drinking, having a good time, and I hadn't seen a lot of these people in, in several months because I've been basically in sober living and rehab. And uh, so now I'm out there and some of my neighbors and old friends that I hadn't seen in a while uh, were there and they said, and they said, Hey, Steve, how's, how's it going? What's been, I haven't seen you in a while. And that was the moment that I had to decide about who I wanted to be. Do I want to be, um, make a false front and not tell anyone, be like, everything's great. Uh, this is life life's awesome I know oh, it's great or do I just come out and spill the beans and say you know or somewhere in between so <laughs> I said well you know I've I've been in sober living and I'm in a new apartment my wife divorced me and I'm and my ex-wife is right over there with her new boyfriend that's my day-to-day <laughs> so I was just I was like that's how it is that's just the reality of what I have and they're like oh my gosh wow that, that like, it must be uncomfortable. I'm like, yeah, it's uncomfortable, but I can't change it. This is just the way it is. Yeah. So at that point, I learned to kind of understand that I can't change with the past, and I have to only do good now going forward mm-hmm. and try to do as good as possible in every aspect of my life. My work, focus on that. My daughter, when I'm with her 100%, you know, try to slowly mend my relationship with my ex so it's not confrontational for the benefit of my daughter. So that was the moment where I basically said, I'm just going to be open about what I went through. Yeah, that's great. I mean, um, and I know now you, you know, you married your high school sweetheart. (laughs) You've got your relationship with your daughter. You've got a stepson. You're at LPL. Um, You sort of have a happy ending. Um, And I know I I would love to hear stories from you all day. (laughs) Um, But we're just about out of time. I'd really like to thank you, Steve, for um, coming. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on the show and especially for for being so open about these issues. I really think this is going to help people who might be in similar situations. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah, If I could just say one last last thing. It's it's what I found that I get the most reward in life right now is, is uh, I mean, I, this is not a paid thing, right? This is, you know, I flew out here on my own. I'm just doing this because, because I found uh, I'm a mentor for this uh, Debbie's Dream Foundation. There's things that I'm doing. I, I've, I've been working for a book on a book for the last eight years just because I, I want to help people. My payment has been the messages and the communication that people tell me that I've helped them more or I've been an inspiration or their hero or whatever it is in their terms. And, and if I can get this to that, you can get through these tough times and that there is something beyond that hole that you can get in. That's my reward right now. That really is. And I, that's more than anything else I can ask for. Cause I want, in the end, I want my wife and daughter and stepson to be proud of me. And that's my gift back to the world. And I was put in this position, I guess. So this is all I can do. Yeah. Thank you so much. 
Well, thank you. If you have a struggle and wish to share your experience and help others in similar situations, please feel free to reach out to me at transparencywithdianab at gmail.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to Transparency with Diana B. If you've not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This is Diana Britton reminding you that where there is healing, there is hope. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Transparency with Diana B. podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you have regarding your particular situation.